On Tech News Today, Pebble launches a thin round watch. Facebook puts you into the Star Wars movie. And a new app lets you harness and synchronize a huge number of smartphones to play really loud music. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, September 24th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. With one simple integration, you can offer your customers every way to pay. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is Fusion Editor Kashmir Hill. Hey, Kashmir, how are you doing today? I am good. Morning. Good morning. Now, you told me right before the show that you interviewed one Edward Snowden recently, and that hasn't aired yet, but... Uh, what was that like? Like, where what, was he like in a in an underground bunker? Like, what, how did that happen? <laughs> um, we had a Google Hangout, which is how he usually does his kind of public talks. Um, this will air tonight uh, at the EFF Pioneer Awards, and you could tell there's a green screen green screen behind him because, like, every time he moved, yeah. I would get that weird blur that you get on his edges. Um, uh, so yeah, it was fun to talk to him. Did he leak anything? <sighs> Uh, no, he didn't. I actually asked him. I actually asked him it, whether John Oliver, when he handed him that folder that he said his uh, scandalous selfie was inside, whether it really was a, a photo of John Oliver's um, um, private areas. And he would not tell me. He said he could neither confirm nor deny. He's pretty. He's pretty good now at yeah. keeping things under wraps. Although that sounds like a yes to me. You know, <laughs> otherwise he would just say no, no, no. Uh, so, so how can people enjoy these Fusion Awards that you talked about? Uh, what, what is the URL for that? So this is for the EFF, actually, oh, EFF, the Electronic okay. Frontier Foundation. It's yes. their Pioneer Awards. Um, you actually have to be in the audience in San Francisco tonight, uh, but I'll have a story coming tomorrow with our interview. Okay, wonderful. Can't wait to see that. Well, let's jump right into the news. We have lots of it and not much time because, of course, we're going to be live blabbing the Oculus event at 10 o'clock this morning Pacific. So uh, we got to move through this pretty quickly. Let's get started. Virtual reality is virtual, virtually real, but who will create the content? If a startup called Voxelus has its way, you will. Daniel Turdeman is a senior writer for Fast Company and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, are you at the Oculus event in Los Angeles right now? I am literally on my way over to the event right now. Uh, uh, so if you hear some traffic noises, because I'm crossing streets in Hollywood. It is Los Angeles, after all, Hollywood, etc. So there is going to be traffic. So tell us about Voxelus. What is this thing all about? Uh, this is about user-generated content for virtual reality. Um, they're sort of attacking the idea that, you know, when all the virtual reality hardware comes out, you know, uh, like the Oculus Rift when it uh, is released next year, uh, early next year, that there's going to be, you know, a dearth of, a dearth of content because no matter how many professional companies are making content, it just doesn't scale to the amount that's going to like really get millions of people you know, feeling satisfied with the hardware they buy. So they think that uh, users are the way to do it by making, by, by creating a system where just about anybody can make a, a virtual reality game. Uh, they showed me a demo yesterday and, and they really made it happen. In five minutes, uh, they created a very simple game, uploaded it, and I was able to uh, play it on Gear VR. This literally took five to 10 minutes. Hey, Daniel, thank you so much for doing this. And I really hope you are walking safely. Um, what platforms is, is this going to work on? Will it work on any VR platform? It's, yeah, it's cross platforms. And, and uh, They're platform agnostic is, is the way they put it. Uh, they built it on Unity, so it, it'll work. Uh, initially, it's going to be on Gear. Uh, it's going to be on Rift after that. But uh, they, they want it to be working on any um, VR system. 
And, um, and of course, the way this works is you have all these objects which are being created, and they're, they're quickly churning them out, and you essentially compile the, uh, the, the objects that they, they create. But will third-party companies or users be able to create objects, or do they have to wait for the company to make them? Uh, no. So, so initially, what they're, what they're launching right now is their built or their content creation system, which comes preloaded with uh, a couple hundred objects. They said they're going to add more objects every, um, every week or so. Eventually, though, they're going to create an app store. And in the app store, users will be able to uh, upload their own objects um, so, that, uh, so that anybody who's building can you know, either use their own, use the ones that are preloaded, or buy ones from other people. All right. Well, uh, how about price and availability? What's, what's, uh, how can people get their hands on this thing? Uh, the content creation tool is available now, um, and there's a link to that in my story. Um, the App Store is going to be later on. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly when they said. Um, and pricing is all going to be free. What you'll be paying for is that content. Um, if you want to like buy somebody's uh, object or something, if they make a really beautiful building or you know a landscape or something, you'll be paying for that. Wow, that sounds really, really cool. Uh, Daniel is at fastcompany.com, uh, and you can follow him on Twitter at GreeterDan. Daniel, thank you so much for tuning in, especially as you're hoofing it across Hollywood. Uh, yeah, sorry, great about, background. sorry about that. No, it, lo it looks great. It didn't sound quite that great, but it looks fantastic. There's some Gucci bags in the background. Fantastic. Yep. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Okay, thanks for having me. All right, well, we have a breaking news story. Facebook is down, so everybody panic. <sighs> Uh, what are we going to do? I don't, I don't know. I guess we'll just keep doing the show. Uh, How'd you find that out, Mike? Were you checking Facebook during that interview? Oh, good heavens, no. Good heavens, no. <laughs> I saw it on Twitter, actually. <laughs> All right, well, more news in a second. But first, let's talk about Braintree, one of our sponsors today. You know, Braintree, if you want to take Bitcoin, you know, there are actually people out there who, who want to pay for your products and services using Bitcoin. And, of course, Braintree, Bitcoin just is automatic. You just install, you know, and use the code for Braintree, and you are able to accept everything, credit cards, you name it, Apple Pay, whatever it is that's happening in terms of the world of payments, Braintree can accept it, and again, automatically. Now, there's a trend in apps called the Invisible App, and then there's another trend called the Invisible Feature. And the most powerful of these is Invisible Payments, and you've experienced this if you've used Uber. When you use Uber, you, you open the app, and you basically tell the app where you want to go, you see the drivers driving around, and then a driver will pick up that job, basically, and they'll come get you. You get in the car, right? You go to the location, and you get out of the car, and you're done. At no point did you ever even interface with any sort of payment system. In a few minutes, you'll get, you get a, you know, after you get out of the car, you get a receipt telling you how much it costs and all that kind of stuff. That is an invisible feature. That is invisible payments. And Braintree is the master of making this happen. That's why not just Uber, but Airbnb, Hotel Tonight, Living Social, Muntree, and so many other unicorns in Silicon Valley are using Braintree because it's simply, it's, it's automatic great service for people who are using your app or your service or buying your products. You can use it in 40 countries with 130 currencies. And it solves the problem of mobile cart abandonment, which is pandemic on the Internet. Braintree gives you a full stack payment solution, support for all payment types, including PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, and so much more, all with a single integration. This works across all platforms with superior fraud protection, customer service, and fast payouts. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee free, go to BraintreePayments.com slash TNT. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. IBM opened an office in San Francisco yesterday for its Watson Artificial Intelligence System. Thomas Lee is a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle and joins us to talk about it. Welcome, Thomas. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Are you sitting in a chair? Wow, that's a nice change of pace. <laughs> uh, so why is IBM opening this office and what exactly is going to take place there? They're they going to sit around playing Jeopardy? What, what's going to happen there? <laughs> well, uh, they opened the office to pretty much sell Watson. As you remember, Watson was a kind of experimental supercomputer that uh, defeated uh, two of our previous Jeopardy! champions in a kind of a tournament in 2011. But, you know, for the most part, Watson wasn't commercialized. It was just kind of like this essential of artificial intelligence. So, I, so you know, fast forward today, IBM actually now wants to make you no know, money off Watson. So they uh, they've been partnering with a lot of companies, kind of to test the technology, show the application. 
location. Now they're opening this office in San Francisco, sort of like to serve as their home base for uh, trying to reach out to companies and demonstrate the technology and get them to sign on. And what can Watson actually do? What are they um, What are they trying to sell to companies? What are the coolest uses of Watson outside of answering Jeopardy questions? <laughs> um, basically, Watson's not uh, any one computer. I think people assume that it's just some terminal sitting somewhere. Uh, it's actually a collection of, of technologies. And basically what it can do is essentially is analytics, so crunch a lot of uh, data and then help companies to add insights to it. So uh, one of the things it can do is uh, search uh, images on social media, whether it's video or whatnot, and and it just kind of uh, allow uh, uh, companies to try to identify trends and patterns, and based on the images that they see on like Twitter or video on Facebook or whatnot, and uh, they also have. Uh, ability to do like natural language analysis. So that would actually kind of help in terms of searches. If you want to kind of search a, uh, for a product on a retailer's website and it allows the, uh, the, uh, the, the technology can kind of take in more context to give you a more accurate answer in terms of what you're looking for on that search. Now, is this office going to be open to the public in any way? Will people be able to go and, and try Watson or is there any sort of display area? How, how is this going to interface with the public? Uh, I actually don't think it is going to interface with the public. I, I think it really is a, just a working sort of office for uh, for them to kind of reach out to, especially the people in Silicon Valley that thought was very important to establish those connections. Now, IBM has a presence in Silicon Valley, but um, in terms of actually kind of commercialization to try to really kind of step it up in terms of making money off Watson, that's the primary goal for, for this office, so. You know, um, Google and other companies always had these, uh, had voice assistants available before Apple came up with Siri. But Apple named it Siri and it just like made it very tangible for people and Apple kind of became seen as the leader. Um, do you think IBM uh, naming its, you know, big data analytics tool Watson has been helpful in the same way or is it limiting because we, you know, associate it too much with, with Jeopardy? Well, I think you that's a really good question because uh, I think we're talking about relevance of Watson, right? So it's been around, but it hasn't kind of really done anything, at least commercially. So, uh, you know, I asked IBM folks, you know, uh, these days, you know, Silicon Valley dominates the discussion. You know, we, we talk about, you know, Siri and Google and search and all that. And they're all working on their analytics, right? They're all working on big data. Everyone is working on big, big data analytics and artificial intelligence. And there's a lot of venture capital money that's flowing into these things. But the IBM folks say that um, they're, way the, they're way ahead of the game, that their technologies are not just talk or in development. They're here. They're real. Most importantly, that they can bring scale to these technologies that they're actually uh, uh, can bring all these tools to get all these capabilities together and kind of offer companies kind of like a, a menu of these technologies like what do you need what do you want to do and we have x this technology this technology this technology and you can bring it all together and watson can do this for you so they say they can bring scale and they also say that their technologies are real ready for prime time I also think it's interesting that, uh, of course, the you know Silicon Valley and the Peninsula and Mountain View and Palo Alto, et cetera, has been largely taken over by the giant companies, the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks, and so on. And the startup scene has really gravitated to San Francisco, and I think that's a, a, a strong reason why they would go to San Francisco. Uh, so that is a, yet another um, you know a badge for the city of San Francisco as the center of startups in the world. Thomas Lee is at sfchronicle.com and on Twitter at by Tom Lee. Thomas Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Pebble yesterday released a thin and round smart smartwatch called the Pebble Time Round. Scott Stein is a senior editor for CNET and joins us to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, thanks, Mike. Besides roundness, what's new in the Pebble Time Round? Well, roundness and thinness is kind of the big thing. You know, it's meant to run very similar software to the Pebble Time, the Pebble Time Steel. And in fact, previous Pebble watches are going to be updated to take advantage of Timeline and some of the new software elements, uh, even going back to the original Pebble. So this is really a design play. And uh, it's coming hot off the heels of the, of the previous Pebble watches that came out just this spring and summer. Uh, it it is a shorter battery life. It makes compromises in some of the things that we thought of Pebbles as being superior in. 
two day battery life now instead of a you know seven or ten days. And um, water resistance is not quite the same, but it's meant to be more attractive and look more like a regular watch. Um, and it's being sold at similar prices to the previous Pebble times. Scott, I know you have tried many of these smartwatches, and you gave this a very glowing review. Um, do you like this more than what else is out there, and why? Well, I do like the Pebble watches because I think right now it's very evolutionary. This one, I, I think, is one in a series. So I like that their effort is going towards uh, towards being smaller because I think people don't want something uh, quite as clunky on their wrist. But I do wish it had more battery life. I think that was a great building point. You don't want to have to charge things all the time. I think it's interesting that Apple has kind of set a new expectation that you're going to charge these things on your wrist every night. Uh, I really like that Pebble was was countering that. Now it looks like they're they're kind of moving in the direction that Apple and others are. Uh, I think that it's great that all these watches are going to share common software, although recent uh, kind of discovery I found out is that it's not going to be quite so simple with the Pebble time round. The apps are going to have to be modified a little bit to take advantage of that round screen. The question is how many app developers are really going to make the effort to do that? Uh, would it make it sort of like less powerful device? I, lo I love the idea of Apple uh, having an effect on the industry by lowering expectations for everyone, <laughs> making it easier. So, so are you saying that the old uh, apps won't run on this? Well, they will run with modification. And it's funny because when I first met with them, they were suggesting that they would run. And then I did get an update saying that uh, there's going to be there's an SDK that will allow those apps to be modified to work on the RAM, which is what would make more sense. Uh, so no, the basic elements of notifications and things like the timeline, which actually that's what most people use a smartwatch for, those will work right off the bat. But if you do want to run some of those apps from the App Store, it could be that a lot of these apps may need to be modified to work. And again, I, I wonder, you're looking at so many different wearables and everything's getting kind of so fragmented in this landscape. Uh, where are app developers really going to focus on? Are they all going to leap aboard and make stuff for this brand new watch? Odds are probably not because you have so many other pebbles that are square. You know, it would take a certain effort to get to that point. So I think inevitably it might mean that the round is more of a, a fashion play meant to be kind of a pared down experience, even though it's still fully fledged to some degree. I think it's more about getting, getting notifications in case you miss them versus the full Pebble experience, I think as I bet by the end of the year, it'll sort of feel like that. Okay, so how much does this thing cost? I know there's a range of prices. And when can people buy it? Well, it's available for pre-order now. Uh, it's $249. And it's going to come out uh, November 8th, I believe that's going to be a retail release. And that brings up a question about uh, everyone who had pre-ordered or backed uh, things through Kickstarter. Pebble made this big Kickstarter play with the previous Pebble Times, and there's a, a lot of uh, internet frustration because they didn't necessarily know this other watch was going to be coming. Uh, those who, th that brings a second point, which is that those who uh, had just Kickstarter back the Pebble Times steal, they are offering you a chance to change your order or try on both, uh, which is a nice touch. But for those who bought the time before, and I was saying that the time is a really good watch too, it's a bit of a, um, it's a, bit of a surprise. I think, though, this is going to be a really different type of watch, and I, I would bet that the people who, a lot of people who bought that previous one, were like, like me, were going for the battery life and the full water resistance, may be happy to know that the new one is not providing more of that. It's a different idea. Now, uh, I suggested that there was a range of prices, and you said it was $249. Is there, is there not more expensive ones? I didn't see that. I, I, I have to check the full price range. I mean, we were told it was $249, um, maybe depending on different types of bands that you get for it. Uh, but the goal is to make this thing uh, pretty affordable. Uh, Eric Mijagovsky had, had mentioned when I was talking to him that they see themselves as the swatch of the smartwatch world, uh, looking at Apple as sort of making the, uh, well, they are making an Hermes watch, but you know, the, the Hermes or the Rolex uh, pushing in that direction. I think the price gap is, is a little closer than that, so it's, it's a little bit different if you're buying one of the affordable Apple Watches. But uh, I think that that's an interesting idea, that they don't want to go too high, and they realize that this is going to be sort of uh, you know, more for people who buy maybe a you know, type of a diesel watch or you know, a watch at a store that's not super expensive. That's the utilitarian pitch here. 
Uh, Jason has also been looking this up behind the scenes and tells me uh, and confirms that it is, in fact, just one price. So uh, yeah. that is that is nice. It doesn't, like the uh, Apple Watch, go up to $18,000, for example. Right. Uh, Scott Stein is at CNET.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Jet Scott. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you. A new product from HipChat called HipChat Connect is scheduled for a November beta launch. Sean Captain is an independent technology journalist who got an exclusive look at HipChat Connect and wrote about it for Fast Company. Uh, welcome to the show, Sean. Hi. <laughs> so glad you're here. Now, how is HipChat Connect different from regular HipChat? Well, what their goal is, is to make it so essentially you never leave the HipChat app. So what they've done is they've taken the right third um, of the app and brought it so that essentially another app can come into and actually appear like in a window in HipChat. So you're never really leaving the HipChat window. Um, Sean, it seemed like every time you tried to get HipChat to tell you about user numbers or revenue, um, they didn't really want to reveal that, whereas Slack has been quite open and transparent about those numbers. How do you think HipChat is doing in comparison to, to Slack, who's their biggest competitor? Yeah, I know that's a good question. We, we pressed them several times to give us numbers. Um, I, I have some anecdotal information that says that Slack is, or sorry, that HipChat is actually doing fairly well. I mean, they've been in this market for close to six years and they have established a customer base. Um, so I don't think they're getting wiped out by Slack, but until they give us numbers, we can't prove it. Now, you tried or, or saw a demo of an app working inside HipChat called New Relic. Can you talk about what that mm -hmm. was like? Um, yeah, so that's, I think that a lot of what they have in mind right now is supporting um, like developers and IT teams and things like that. So New Relic, um, which I wasn't familiar with until I tried it out, um, is um, essentially it's sort of a monitoring um, system for whether it's your servers or your IT department or whatever else. And you can essentially see if there's a problem and report a bug ticket um, and assign that. So their their sales point on that was instead of, say, maybe getting an alert in HipChat, which you can already do with a lot of different programs, they can provide alerts to a, um, to a, um, a messaging app, um, you also see um, the actual um, app right there, the actual program um, uh, right there in, in, the, in the window of HipChat. So, and everyone else sees it as well. So essentially everyone can see what's going on. It's not a matter of texting, okay, I did this. And then someone's asking, you know, did you complete that? And if you text back, yes, I did. Everyone can actually see the same thing happening in the same window. I remember when everyone started to basically use these kind of corporate IRC channels. And in the beginning, it was Campfire and it was HipChat. And basically, it seemed like everyone used one or the other. And then Slack came along and just kind of like went so viral so quickly. What do you think it, it was about Slack? Was it just like right time, right place? Um, why is it that they were able to catch up to HipChat and then maybe pass it so quickly? I, I think it could be the right time and the right place. Um, I was talking with um, Slack as well for this article, and um, I asked, you know, what what were your um, customers, what were they using before? And they said nothing. Essentially, the, for a lot of people, Slack was their first experience with, uh, with group chat apps. Um, so the first thing you see is, you know, they didn't necessarily realize that there were other alternatives out there. And I mean, that may have to do, I mean, HipChat might be partly responsible for that as well as all those other um, group messaging apps in terms of getting the industry founded. Um, but also I think people are just more and more chat friendly. I mean, whether it's Snapchat or whether it's, um, you know, using um, Facebook chat or anything else, I think we're kind of at the point where people are feeling more comfortable with that. All right. Well, Sean Captain is at seancaptain.com and on Twitter at, you guessed it, Sean Captain. Sean, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> you bet. Chinese phone giant Xiaomi confirmed today that it's getting into the laptop business. The first Xiaomi laptops are expected to ship in the first half of next year. Earlier this month, Bloomberg reported that Xiaomi, which has a reputation for imitating Apple, was targeting Apple with a laptop similar to the MacBook Air. So not surprising there. My guess is Cashmere Hair will be a little bit cheaper. Yeah, Xiaomi, is a, it's amazing how cheaply they can sell these products. Um, I just started reading, actually, Clay Shirky spent a year in Shanghai to write a book about Xiaomi. So I oh, wow. just started it, um, and I'm excited to, to learn some of their secrets, uh, how they can make these products. 
um, and sell them so for, for so little money. They sell them for little money, but they also have a rabid fan base. That's really, that combination is very, very interesting uh, to me. You know, in the, in the United States and, and Europe and elsewhere, outside of China, Xiaomi is like a Xiao what? They don't, right. they don't really have any sort of reputation. They're just like, they're just on the list of those Chinese companies that are making cheap phones. But within China, they're a special company. They have like rabid fan bases. So, uh, and, they, and they want to come to the U.S. now. They, oh, they yeah. want to get that reputation here. They absolutely do. Uh, they absolutely do. Well, we have uh, some more news coming up. But uh, first, let's talk about our other sponsor, which is Prosper. You know, there there aren't very many good ways to borrow money. And, and of course, borrowing money is often a very good idea. If you've got high interest credit cards, that's a huge waste of money. It makes a lot of sense to go to prosper.com and get a loan and pay off those credit cards. You'll save a ton of money. It also makes sense if you're starting a business uh, to, to borrow money or if you want to fix up your house. Lots of good reasons to borrow money. Not very many, many good options for borrowing money. Prosper.com, of course, is the mother of all good options for borrowing money. You can borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days and use the money for just about anything. All you do is you just go to the site, you give some basic information about yourself, you check your rates and review your loan options, and once the once lenders come along and invest in your loan, the money is deposited directly into your bank account, and then monthly loan payments are fixed and, and uh, they'll be automatically deducted from your account. There aren't any hidden fees or prepayment penalties, and the interest rate will never change. This is a great, great loan. And so it's all, you know, it's all very internet-y and Silicon, Silicon Valley-ish. It, it's all above board. You know exactly what you're getting when you go into it. And it's just very, very straightforward. Now and for a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers and listeners a $50 Visa gift card with your low interest loan. You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. Just go to prosper.com slash twit for this special offer that's just for you. In courtroom drama news, the whole concept of app-driven services provided by independent contractors is under threat by more legal action. As we reported previously, Uber and Lyft are facing lawsuits over the reclassification of independent contractors as employees. And now class action lawsuits are going after Grubhub and DoorDash. And another lawsuit is, de in, uh, is a demand for arbitration on behalf of a San Francisco driver who drove for a company called Caviar. All these lawsuits and complaints, including the Uber and Lyft ones, were filed in Superior San Francisco Court, uh, Superior Court in San Francisco, by the same Boston attorney, Shannon Liss Riordan. These lawsuits generally claim that these on-demand economy startups treat contractors like employees, without providing them with the benefits that employees are entitled to. Now, Cashmere Hill, I don't want to rush to judgment here, but I, I don't like, I don't like the feel of this, simply because. Um, you know, as you know, we've talked, uh, said a couple of times on the show before, there's a cost benefit to these kind of on-demand services, to being a provider, to being a contractor for these things. You get tons of flexibility. Uh, there are many other benefits. And then there are downsides compared to working for a big company. You don't get, you know, health care. You don't get this, that, and the other thing. And you, you make that choice. You say, okay, I like that set of costs and benefits. Um, and I'm going to choose to to do that. And then after having... Um, done that after the fact they want to come back and they already got the benefits and now they want to erase the costs it just doesn't feel right to me what do you think yeah i, I do think it's it's quite complicated um i i interviewed shannon earlier this year and profiled her so we talked nice. at length about this um and i mean these are really a new business model and they don't fit that well under existing labor law um, uh, you know, the, the crux of her lawsuits is that there are certain ways in which, um, these startup companies operate kind of like traditional employers. Um, like you, you have a free schedule and you can work whenever you want, but then, um, Lyft and Uber will have kind of incentives for making sure you work 40 hours a week because you'll make, you know, 10% more as a driver. And so there's, there's little ways in which they're, um, kind of trying to make it, you know, try to make it seem like these are regular, reliable employees um, when they're contractors. I think it's it's a real gray area, and it's hard for the judges to make calls on these. Right now, it feels like uh, Shannon Riordan and the other people that are suing the startups um, are having some legal successes, uh, but we'll see what happens down the line. Yeah, I just I just scares scares me to death. It feels like I don't know European or something to strangle. A, a new concept that could be revolutionary in its cradle before we really even know what it is uh, through through legal action and, and through the courts. Um, 
Yeah, but when that's... Homejoy when Homejoy shut down this year, they kind of um, in their in their goodbye statement, they basically made a nod towards these kinds of suits and said, you know, this is why we can't do this. Um, we need to treat these people as contractors, and they're trying to turn them into employees. Um, so we're definitely seeing that. Uh, and uh, in big number news, we have a gigantic number, two hundred billion. That's the net worth in U.S. dollars of all the technology chiefs who gathered at Microsoft's Redmond cam campus yesterday to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping. And Bill Gates wasn't even there. Topping the list was Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, who has a net worth of $47.8 billion, with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg worth slightly less than that. Notably absent was Google CEO Sundar Pichai. Google and China, of course, don't get along very well because Google is one of the few companies to stand up to the Chinese government's hacking and censorship. Uh, Kashmir Hill, this is a kind of a funny thing. Uh, everybody going to, you know, it's it's weird, for example, to see Mark Zuckerberg at Microsoft's headquarters and to see Tim Cook at Microsoft's headquarters. I wonder if he's ever been there before. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of men in that photo. Not a lot of women. That's right. And I if you count two. Yeah, and if you look at the if you look at the chart, uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of disparity in their their net worths with. Uh, with the Bezoses and the Zuckerbergs with massive quantities of, of, of monetary value and the women that you mentioned and some of the men, including Tim Cook, with, you know, basically it's such a thin line given the scale that, uh, that the Bezoses are, are creating with that chart. Uh, it's, it's almost non-existent. So uh, it's just not fair. <laughs> All right. Well, in news, you can lose a clip from the uh, upcoming movie Star, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, was posted exclusively on Facebook. Video is a 360 degree video, meaning that you, the viewer, are inserted into the scene and you can look around in all directions by moving your mouse or swiping across the screen or touchpad. Well, the posting of the video co coincided with today's Oculus event, the keynote for which will be live blabbing right after this show. And literally, we're going to start in like five minutes. And it's likely that Facebook will now house as many high profile 360 degree videos as it can in an effort to compete with the likes of YouTube for video eyeballs. Uh, I saw it before Facebook crashed. And maybe this is what crashed it. Who knows? But it was a it was really cool. It was really really cool to be inside of a. You're sort of on a speeder on this desert planet, like flying along, and it's just really cool. So what a, what a yeah. And uh, Jason is uh, is lamenting the fact that we can't share it. Well, a free new iOS. I so wait a minute. I want to just pause for a second because this story is this product is really really cool. I want to try this as soon as we can get our hands on it. A free new iOS and Android app called Amp Me harnesses multiple smartphones to create a loud sound system. The app can daisy chain and synchronize what they claim is an unlimited number of smartphones. So you can imagine at a concert, maybe you'd have, I don't know, 5,000 smartphones. It does this by coordinating the other phones using a coded sound. Let's watch the video and hopefully this isn't posted on Facebook. So they synchronize the phones and suddenly it's a Sonos. But this concept, I think this concept is great. And I, and it reminds me of a new Google product called uh, Google Chromecast for Music, I believe, where Google wants to synchronize the various speakers in your house to do something very similar to this. And so this is this feels to me like a new category, Kashmir, of synchronizing speakers, phones, whatever, synchronizing music. Uh, and this is not done in any sort of like synchronizing by listening. I think they're using like these like very precise time clock type of synchronizations and having things play independently so that they sound like they're synchronized. Um, I really love that. I was at a friend's house last night for game night and he did not have any kind of sound system. So we took one of our phones and put it in a, a glass tumbler to make it kind of like louder. <laughs> but this app sounds a lot better. <laughs> yeah, and there are other ways to do that. There's there's some uh, companies that make these giant horns look like a cornucopia, and on the on the top you sort of shove your phone into it, and it just amplifies it acoustically. They're very expensive, and nobody buys them, uh, but they do do the trick. Well, our TNT fan of the day is DRL in Fort Worth, Worth Texas, who said the new side by side features in iOS nine are fabulous. And uh, if we take a look at that photo, there it is using the side by side 
photos. And there's Fort Worth and there's me doing the show. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. Cashmere Hill, when you're not interviewing Edward Snowden, what have you been up to these days? What have I been up to? Pretty much just like uh, looking at the Volkswagen uh, story play out in, yeah. in, in, in disbelief. Um, it's kind of amazing to see software being used to circumvent the law. It's yeah. such a real futury kind of story. It reminds me of those stories that uh, circulated about Samsung a few years ago about how they were cheating on benchmark tests and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know why it reminds me of that. It's not really a related story, but uh, uh, but yeah, it's very very strange. And 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 just uh, as a follow up, how is your karaoke startup uh, coming along? You still <laughs> working on that? Still working on it. Looking for a truck. Yeah. If anybody knows of one for sale? All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Cashmere Hill, and we'll see you next time. Bye, Mike. Good Bye. luck with BR. Thank you. Let us know what's on your mind. Send email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. That's 260-868-7469. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Spotify or choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. If you're ever in the greater Brickhouse area, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv before you come in. You can follow me at elgin.com. Also, don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.